is John Sharp. I'm merely an introducer, no need for applause. Uh, I'm John Sharp, I'm the Associate Professor of Games and Learning up at Parsons, just up the street a little ways. Uh, but for the, today's purposes, I'm also the Associate Editor of the Well Played Journal. Uh, well Played is a journal focused on what we would call close playings, kind of like a close reading, except it's about games, and trying to unearth some of the uh, interesting, defining, aspects, aesthetics, if you will, of games. We've now done three book issues, and we're now in a journal format, uh, releasing twice a year. And when we say well-played, we're really thinking about a couple of different things. Well-played in the sense of being well-read, so having a breadth of understanding of games and their many forms and the many kinds of play experiences they can provide. And then well-played in the sense of the way we maybe more traditionally think about it, a well-played hand of cards, perhaps, a well-played uh, shot in a tennis match. And so it's a journal looking at the two different ways, hoping to help define and develop an aesthetics of gameplay. Uh, a couple years ago, we started doing a presentation series around well-played, uh, we've done it at Indicade, here at Games for Change, and a few other conferences. So, I think she's back here. Uh, we have Tracy Fullerton today, who is the chair of the Interactive Media and Games Division at USC. She runs the Game Innovation Lab there on the campus, and she's the author of a Game Design Workshop now in its uh, third edition. I'm creeping back to look, see if she's back here yet. Tra here she comes. So uh, please join me in welcoming Tracy Fullerton, who will be talking about the Fulbright Company's Gone Home. All right, welcome everyone. Um, I was gonna ask who played Gone Home, but since I can't see any of you, uh, Couple of people. Okay. <laughs> awesome. One of our finalists and uh, a lovely game. Uh, I'm very happy to have a chance to talk about it today. So, for those of you who have not played uh, Gone Home, uh, it presents itself first as a lightweight horror game. So, uh, actually, is it possible to get the entire screen that's on my laptop showing rather than just a, s a small section of the center? It was showing earlier today. It seems to be at the wrong resolution. That's going to screw everything up. We could just look at a center of the game, actually. Um, so while someone hopefully is working on that, um, is someone working on that? Uh, let me talk a little bit about uh, the game. So it presents itself uh, at first as a lightweight horror game. And its title screen shows an eerily darkened home. Um, surrounded by dark pines, uh, one light beckoning us to enter. And upon entering the game, we learn that it is uh, uh, just after midnight, and we hear a message from a young woman uh, to her mother who telling her that she'll be arriving home uh, from the airport this night, not to pick her up. Um, I want to go to the next section, but it's a video, and I'd hate for you guys to only see the center of that video. <laughs> So we'll just give this gentleman a chance to do his work. Tell me when it looks right. No, it's still showing. It was working well before we tested the other one. Mm, so was something changed in the resolution? Nope, nothing changed. Okay. It's a lovely game. Um, <laughs> you can try that. Okay. It's not correct, but you can try it. I, it'll be fine. As long, as long as we can see the whole screen, even if, you'll, you'll get the idea if it's squished. Let's go. Just went dark again. 
what, what did, what just happened? You put it back to where it was. Yeah. This is the, uh, I'm just going to mirror this. And I, any resolution at this point, that's the whole screen. This is going to take us a little walk away. Did it again. Okay, here we go. All right. There. No, let's see. Shoot. Yeah. Yeah, uh, well, I know that. That's what I just told them. <laughs> okay, maybe I'll just have to act this out. Um, she is, she was on the or actually, you know what I'm going to do? Uh, I'm just going to go back, and we're not going to have a presentation. We're just going to go back to the videos and see if I'll just play. It's called punting. Uh, pictures. Is that her pictures. out there operating that? There she goes. Yeah, pictures. Thank you. I appreciate that. Okay. Here's the game. Um, uh, it's a little, there's a little, a lot of light on the screen um, here, so if we could bring some lights down. Uh, basically, uh, it's a dark and stormy night, and um, can we get a little bit of volume on the game? She has volume? No volume there. Thank you. Uh, one light is uh, flickering on the porch, and pinned to the front door is a note, an ominous sounding note from someone named Sam who warns us not to go digging around uh, to find out where they are. Uh, but of course, is that going to stop us? No, this is a game. And we are going to do exactly the opposite of what the note tells us. Uh, so the front door is locked, but by ex exploring the front porch and looking in some of the usual places uh, for a key, um, we, can, uh, we learn uh, not only um, how to interact with things, um, but we find uh, under the, of course, the Christmas duck, um, the key to what we know must be the house. So this search teaches us basically how to interact, uh, most of what we know really, to uh, how to interact with the game. How to move, how to um, click on items, how to add them to and access our inventory. Um, we also find out the name of our own player character, Caitlin Greenbrier. Um, we see we have a, for a, a passport, a boarding pass, uh, and now we have, of course, the means to enter the house. So we do. And as we go in, inside is a fairly impressive um, haunted house-like foyer with an iconic central staircase and flickering lights. Uh, we're still being told by the no, game no, no, really. no. that this is a horror experience. Um, uh, and all the codes of like mayhem and mystery are there. And Dear the general Katie, sense that something is wrong. So much has changed, even just since you've been away. We moved into this house. I'm in a new school, and my big sister being gone for a year doesn't make it any easier. It doesn't feel real, but I'm not gonna let it phase me. I used to tell you everything, and if I can't do it in person, because you're off gallivanting around who knows where, I'll tell it to this journal, just like I was talking to you. Sam. Sam. Hello. Sam. Sam, where are you? Really? I need to talk to you. Please be there. So, uh, so I got my turn this down a little bit. So where is everyone? From the shipping invoice, we know that the family has recently moved into this house, probably uh, while we, the player character, uh, were traveling. 
And on f hearing the first audio journal from Sam, the same person who left us that desperate note, um, we have some context for who she is. Uh, by the family portrait on the wall, we can quickly situate ourselves in the family. We're older sister to younger sister Sam. Parents are Terry and Jan. Everyone seems happy on the surface of this portrait. So where are they? Um, let me get the next sequence here. So, it's very dark, I haven't turned on any lights. And as it turns out, um, Gone Home is a horror game, uh, in a sense. As we explore the house, uh, it continues to play with our expectations around that genre. The rooms are all creepy and dark until we turn the lights on ourselves, and there are signs of life interrupted everywhere. Sometimes, that life seems to have taken a dark turn like the moment uh, when we go into Sam's bathroom to find the bathtub splattered with what looks like blood. It turns out to be red hair dye, a less troublesome horror, unless you're the parent of a teenage girl, I suppose. Um, uh, it is this kind of narrative tease, however, that draws us forward through the house, uh, a sense that something really is happening here, even though we can't put our finger on it right away. Lonnie brought her hair dye over today. She said, I need to fix these roots. Think you could help? Dyeing hair is weirdly intimate. I don't know if I've touched someone else's scalp before. That's pretty intimate, right? It felt intimate. We looked into the mirror together after, and I expected her to say something about how it looked crappy or good or whatever. But that's when she said, you're so beautiful. And she was looking at me. Right in that moment, I wanted to say something, but I waited, and the moment was gone. So the mechanics of the game are beyond simple. Uh, you can walk around using the standard WASD keys, and you can look, and there's a tiny reticule in the center of the screen, and when you're close enough to interact with an object, and the reticle is over, a highlight contextualizing that action appears. You can turn lights on and off. You can open and close drawers, pick up objects and put them back, uh, or as it turns out, you can toss them around if you're feeling messy. Um, you can flush toilets and turn on faucets, pick up papers and notes and read them. And it's sometimes difficult to tell what is meaningful interaction and what is simply touching stuff around the Greenbrier house. The game is filled with what designer Steve Gaynor calls pointless interactions uh, in the commentary uh, section. Uh, following the design lineage of uh, exploration games like System Shock and Deus Ex, Gaynor wanted the player to be able to interact with basic parts of the house in this way. And it's a brilliant choice mechanically because this is, after all, a game in which you play a young person who has returned to their family after time spent out in the world alone to find all of the familiar things of life uh, moved into a new home that you aren't actually familiar with. The everyday and common are made strange, unknown, and somewhat frightening. Lonnie came over today, but everything was different. She was sitting at my desk chair, and she wouldn't look at me. Finally, I asked her what was going on. She said she felt like she'd done something wrong that night in the city. Like I must think... But I said, no, there was nothing wrong. I just wanted to say... But I couldn't find the words. I felt like I was gonna cry, but I wasn't sad. She got up and sat next to me on the bed. I looked at her. Lonnie... Do you think you could ever... And that's when she kissed me. <laughs> so as it turns out, Gone Home is not a supernatural horror game, but rather a game of, 
about those kind of fitful, everyday dreams that sometimes go awry, the kind that plague us in our secret hearts and have the potential to rend families like the Greenbriars apart. It's important to note here that the game was set in 1995, uh, a fictional distance from our own somewhat more enlightened times, uh, when LGBT teens were um, uh, unlikely to find support or openness in their families and community. And by setting that game, the game at that 20-year uh, distance, we are likely to imagine the worst for Sam and Lonnie as we follow their budding romance. Um, Sam, as it turns out, is the central character. We follow her first days at a new school, her sense of alienation from the other students, growing interest in alternative music, riot girl culture, and evolving relationship with Lonnie, the only friend she makes at her new school. Now, I had a screenshot sequence, which um, uh, we won't be able to probably see unless I can somehow resurrect this even at uh, partial. Um, let's see if we can. Maybe I can at least see some of this. Well, these are not going to be visible for you guys. Shame, shame. Uh, well, we'll give it a try anyways. Um, so all of this is told through an interleaving of notes and artifacts and audio journals that we find throughout the house. Um, and as we explore the house, picking up items and opening drawers, um, poking around in these people's lives until we can begin to know them and understand that uh, something has come to a head recently in this house. And that something has many layers to it. And for example, we learn that um, uh, Sam and Katie's father is a writer who, uh, whose work has been published, but not particularly successful. There's notes of alcoholic uh, depression that run through Terry's possessions, uh, signaling a trauma that may actually run uh, deeper than just failed creativity. Uh, Sam herself is an aspiring writer, and we find stories that date back to her youngest days uh, to more recent versions of the same characters uh, who are evolving along with her own self-interest and self-discoveries. Sam's mother, Jan, works for the Forest Service and has an attraction to, possibly more, with a handsome co-worker uh, amusingly named Ranger Rick. Um, there's a sense that Terry and Jan are having troubles as they each deal with the inevitable disappointments of middle-aged life. More than this, there seems to be an actual ghost story associated with the house. The story of Terry's uncle, who left him the house, is told through old newspaper clippings and uh, a letter of vague confession locked in a hidden safe. And the overall sense of tragedy and fixation that Terry has, you can't see this, but it's a height chart for Terry that ends um, in uh, November of 1963, and this fixation he has around that date of 11-22-1963. Uh, so Sam and Lonnie actually seem to have become uh, fascinated with this, this ghost story and are searching out hidden passageways in the house, uh, holding seances uh, in a secret hiding space beneath a staircase. As, as these threads of subtle narrative unwind through the player's search of the home, a foreboding sense arises that the absence of life here all hinges on the love story of Sam and Lonnie which in truth is a very sweet, fairly innocent teenage love story filled, filled with naive angst, rebellion, and self-discovery. And it's only because these are gay teenagers that this typical teenage love story is also a story about the everyday nightmare of coming out. And since we were shown right up front that that frightened scribbled note on the front door, and we have heard that sobbing voice on the phone message calling for Sam, we come to understand that that must be Lonnie, and we fear that this is not a story that this is going to end well. So, let's get back to the video. So an important thing to notice about gone, how Gone Home works so well is the use of traditional storytelling technique um, within an interactive structure. There are four basic questions any writer wants to ask of themselves about their characters. What does the character want? And what does the character need? And what does the audience hope? And what does the audience fear? And Gone Home plays with all of these questions so deftly, hanging our hopes and fears on a thread of possibility that all will turn out well for the Greenbrier somehow, and that these characters will find what they need to cleanse this house of its haunted past and its present.
Katie, you know how mom and dad are. Not exactly super open-minded about things. It feels like every minute I don't spend with Lonnie, I spend worrying about them finding out about us. And what would happen if they did? You know dad's joke about the nunnery that he'd tell whenever you brought boys around the old house? I wonder where he'd want to send me. Probably can't read this, but it's telling her she's grounded. I had an interesting talk with mom and dad tonight. One you were never going to need to have. I mean, you've known, right? I've known. I've known since, like, She-Ra. Mom and Dad didn't, I guess. But they saw the zine and the stuff on the locker, and they were like, is there something we should know about you and Lonnie? And so here's the thing. I was prepared for them to be mad, or disappointed, or start crying, or something. But they were just in denial. You're too young to know what you want. You and Lonnie are just good friends. You just haven't met the right boy. It's a phase. That's what I didn't see coming. That they wouldn't even respect me enough to believe me. Well, joke's on them, because they're in for one very long phase. So I'm not actually going to tell you how Gone Home ends or how all of these threads of ordinary nightmares resolve. What I will say is that Gone Home is part of an important genre of exploration narrative games. Its gameplay is its narrative. It plays with us, with our expectations about horror and haunted houses and the kinds of ghosts that live inside of all of us and that we share with each other through the traces of our lives, postcards and post-it notes and mixtapes and ticket stubs and all of the detritus of life that together tells the story of the ordinary horrors of an ordinary family. And as a game for change, it's part of what I hope will become a more common experience, a game that is meaningful experience first and a discussion of issues second. Like the best of traditional media, games for change need to embrace the emotional aspects of the stories they are telling, not just the instrumental and the behavioral. A game such as Gone Home points to a future in which all games for a change are not set aside as a genre, but rather part of a rich cultural mix of independent media making, taking on important issues on a human and personal scale. I think I actually, uh, since I raced through my, my uh, uh, slides, um, have some time for questions if there are any. However, I cannot see you, so um, hopefully someone can help me with that. Oh, just so to be clear, this is not my game. Um, as a well-played session, the idea is that I am reading this game for you. So um, uh, this is not my game. Um, <laughs> uh, perhaps I should have actually made that clear. But so the, the notion of well-played, which we'll have another one uh, tomorrow with Nick Fortuno reading papers, please, is that game designers uh, play and read deeply a um, uh, one of the um, excellent games of this year. So um, if you want to rephrase your question, um, I'd be happy to do that. But if anyone else has any questions, 
uh, I'm, I'm also happy to answer them. Yes? <laughs> I think it has a deep connection, and as I was discussing with John Sharp at lunch, it's really great that it was set uh, in 1995, right, which comes, uh, which is literally when the, the sort of genre of point-and-click um, mysteries um, were in their heyday, right? So Mist comes out in 1994, and you have this, um, you have things like The Seventh Guest, right? Um, and I think that there's a lot of parts of this game, for example, the fact that they use um, mixtapes as all, there are mixtapes all over the house you can put in audio cassettes and there's there are tons of VHS cassettes all around the house which is, is wonderful kitsch and in so many ways I think that the actual use of the first person point and click um, uh, mechanics are an homage but I also do believe that it's an homage to a genre that's having a, a, a renaissance, a beautiful, wonderful renaissance. And you look at games like Dear Esther, you know, for example, uh, it's, um, uh, I think it's a time to re-examine the first person exploration game and see what other types of stories it can tell. That's a great question. So if you go online, um, one of the interesting things you'll find is because it's presented as a lightweight horror game, uh, a lot of people will have downloaded it thinking that's what it was, right? Oh, this is going to be some sort of puzzly mystery horror game, right? Um, and then they'll play it, and you really start to get an inkling of what the game is really about um, you know, pretty, pretty quickly, right? Um, with the first few audio journals, you really start to get an inkling. And so people will post and say, oh, you know, I downloaded this, but it wasn't what I thought it was, right? Um, and there's this sort of, um, sometimes people are meaner than that. I'm being nice. I'm telling you a nice one. Some people, sometimes people are uh, a little more hater than that. Um, uh, but uh, there's a problem, obviously, when you take a genre and you put it out there and then you're actually twisting it into something else because you're, you're going to reach the people who like that genre and they're not necessarily the audience um, who's going to be interested in your game. But I actually think it's a great uh, technique. I think it's, it's a fascinating, interesting technique because I'm sure there are some people who played it not knowing what it was about, um, especially early on, uh, who were pleasantly surprised. They're just not the guys who get up on the internet and write hater messages, right? But I'm sure there are actually man many people who were pleasantly surprised by what they found. Uh, I think that, you know, this is a game not necessarily for people who are hardcore gamers. It's certainly very simple. Um, it uses game tropes, but it uses them in the lightest, simplest way. Um, so you don't need to be a hardcore gamer to be able to figure out the, lock, the, the very simple lock and key puzzles that essentially keep you from finding out too much of the story early on. And that's all they're there for. They're, they're there to keep you from finding out the ending early on. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Well, Steam's an interesting platform, right? Because you have to get you have to get greenlit, um, and so you have to get greenlit by the Steam community. They have to want you, right? So um, you have to ha you have to hold some value for that community. And I think that was one of the interesting things that that, that uh, these guys did. You know, first of all, they're insiders. The people who who made this game come from commercial AAA games, right? Um, so they have that going for them. And then there is also this kind of initial presentation. Um, and also, of course, it's a beautifully made game. It's very professionally made. Um, and I think that um, if you're going to go the Steam route, especially with a game for change, um, you have to find a way to, to appeal to that audience. And these guys did it without, I think they did it with integrity. I think they did it um, in a way that was right for their game. I suspect that other games that are more on the surface will have difficulty getting greenlit um, through Steam. I only have a few more seconds. Is there a short one? 
Okay, well then, uh, if there's if there's another, oh, sorry, didn't see you. Um, okay, so as a person pushing very hard on, uh, on that, uh, I think that, you know, we as gamers grow up. We want a breath of entertainment. And sometimes we want a slow, meditative experience after coming home from a long day at work. Sometimes we want to investigate interesting ideas. You know, sometimes I want to read, a, I just finished The Goldfinch, sometimes we want to read a 700-page novel. You know, and sometimes we're looking for something short, fat, fast, you're just going to get in and get out. And the fact is, is that we're creating, we're, we're in the business now of creating, um, uh, I think, those alternate experiences for um, all ranges of gamer audiences. And I'm, for me, I think it's, the, it's a wonderful opportunity, and, I, and I'm so glad to see games like this coming out. Well, I, I, I'm actually out of time at this point, but uh, I'm, I'll be around the conference. So thanks very much, everyone. <laughs>